How many people have caught a fish? Okay. Uh, saltwater fish? Okay, not so many with saltwater. You know, we're from Arizona. Most, most of us, I'm, we're transplanted from Washington to the Seattle area. So I was just talking to a guy today. Uh, he said he loves to hunt and fish. And I said, oh, really, where do you go fishing? He goes up in the eastern part of the state. And I said, well, I've never caught a freshwater fish other than a river sucker. And he looked at me like I was crazy. A, a trout, but most of the trout I've ever caught have been in saltwater or um, on their way between the salt water and that. So we fish for salmon. Um, how many people have eaten salmon? How many people know the difference between a salmon and a trout? Okay. There's a significant difference. They look a lot alike, but a, a, a trout lives for years, right? Some trout, 20 years. A lake trout can get huge and they live in the Great Lakes, but they don't die after they spawn. Okay, a salmon, a salmonoid family, they die every four to five years typically. A big king salmon can live seven, eight years, and then it spawns and it dies. Its life cycle is fairly short. Okay, so I fish up in Bristol Bay. Um, it's this area right here in Alaska. Alaska's fisheries are probably the most important fisheries in the world. Um, Volume-wise and economically, and I'm not just talking about salmon, we're talking about crab, um, black cod, halibut, um, every major Pacific Ocean species, um, cold water, you're going to find in Alaska. And not just find it, you're going to find it in abundance. Um, so this is the Bristol Bay area. One of the things you want to note about this Bristol Bay area and the, the different fishing districts are noted, Togiak, Nushigak, Naknak, Kwejak, Egegek, and Yugashik. These are all places I've fished before, but every river system, and these are the mouths of the rivers, okay? When they spawn, they go out, spend some time in the ocean, come back and up the rivers and spawn, and they spawn and stay in these lakes for one or two years as egg and fry, and then come down the rivers to three years later as smolt, go back into the oceans, live in the oceans two, one or two years and then come back, okay? These are huge lake systems. Uh, there's, there's a bigger map of Alaska back there, but Lake Iliamna, other than the Great Lakes, is probably the biggest lake in the US. It's huge. It took me a day from here to here, traveling about 10 knots, okay? That took me a whole day from here to here. Um, What's so the name of that lake? Uh, Iliana. Lake Iliana. Uh, <laughs> the, this, this series of lakes, okay, so Jesse and the kids were up to Dillingham for their first time. We went up to, not this lake, this was Snake Lake right here. Okay, we went to Snake Lake one day. But this is a fairly short river called the Wood River, and it goes into Lake Alignigic, Alignigic or Alignigic, and then it connects to the five lakes. That's a very, it's called the Tikchik Lake System. Um, and it's a state park, it's one of the largest state parks in, in Alaska. Down uh, in this area, you probably heard of Katmai, right? Katmai, what do you, what do you guys know about Katmai? Any, anybody? There's the five, I'm gonna skip that real quick. Katmai, okay. Largest population of bears. Okay, oh, no. biggest bear uh, observation. When you see pictures of bears in waterfalls catching fish, that's probably Katmai. Okay, uh, I had a friend who went there last year. Took his kid. Uh, you're, he said it was amazing. They got platforms, you know, right next to the bears. Um, Is that where they flew in on the helicopters to go in to see the bears? They flew. They flew in on floats. They went to King Salmon. Um, they went to King Salmon. Yeah. And then they went up, I think it's up in here, got my falls or something. Uh, anyways, go back here. Okay, five, five major Pacific Ocean species of salmon, okay? The Chinook are the biggest, right? And I'll show you a picture of a Chinook. Chum, um, coho, pink, sockeye. Can anybody tell me the uh, common names other than that? I quiz my kids all the time. Okay, nobody? Um, Chinook, king salmon, okay? Chum, dog salmon, coho, silver salmon, 
pink salmon, humpy, and a sockeye is a red salmon. Okay. Um, you saw in the next picture uh, that a lot of the fish that we are looking for in Bristol Bay are red salmon as they turn red. Uh, not only because they turn red when they're spawning and they have a big green head, you'll see, but their flesh is red. Okay. Sockeye and chum are unique. They primarily have gill rakers. They don't eat bait. Okay. That's what makes their flesh a little more red. Okay. Primarily sockeye because they eat krill. It's a shrimp kind of cocktail. And, and that has a lot of carotids in it, which are really good for us. Okay. So anyways, the five types of salmon. This is their life cycle. Okay. Uh, you can begin and start probably right here. Right. Life begins, eggs. They hatch soon in the in the rivers or the lake beds. Then they become fry. They live in the lakes, like I said, one or two years usually. And then they come down the rivers. We don't know why they come down after a year being a fry, or why they sometimes hold in the lake for another year. We don't know, and we're always wondering why did they stay in Lake Iliamna two years. Where in the Nushagak Lake system, they always come out after year one. But in the Iliamna, they stay one or two. And we don't know. We have not figured out what triggers that choice of theirs. But it, it happens. And uh, we're always trying to predict when that's going to happen. And we take smolt counts as they come out of the rivers to see how many smolts are returning to the oceans. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in terms of management. Anyways, they get smolt, they go onto the ocean, they, they stay this nice bright color, then they get into the fresh water. As soon as they hit the fresh water, they start changing color. And it doesn't take long. We saw it last year. Um, half a day in the river, they'll, they'll change to that. Whoa. Okay, and we saw exactly that outside of a stream. Maybe not that broad of a reach, but um, we got out of the boat and spooked them and they just went everywhere. So it was kind of cool. So anyways, uh, it's a huge natural resource. Um, we're competing. Um, we're trying to get our share of them, and the bears are trying to get their share. Okay? Um, this is a typical day on the fishing grounds. Okay, It's competitive. Um, like I said, Bristol Bay and its fisheries, the most valuable sockeye salmon fishery is probably the most, sockeye the most valuable salmon. So I'd say it's not only the most valuable salmon, sockeye salmon fishery is probably the most valuable fishery in the world in terms of one species. Um, so it's competitive. And this we catch them with nets and we bring them on board and um, then we deliver them to the uh, deadliest catch boats. This is a king salmon. Okay, They obviously get bigger. The sockeye salmon here are your typical five to six pounds, but the king salmon, they can actually live a little bit longer. In Washington, they're documented to have lived almost nine years at times, and they get up to 80 to 100 pounds. This is, this is about a 30, 40 pound, or 35 maybe. So obviously, it's a big uh, industry. We catch, and we'll get to a little bit, um, millions of pounds. 100 million, 150 million pounds in a three week period. Okay, because they, they're passing through those river mouths in about a three to four week period. And we've got to process them. So we have huge um, plants, processing plants that can them and flash freeze them into fillets. And that's what you see at the supermarket, obviously. Um, wild salmon. So here's, here's the world sockeye salmon supply a chart. Uh, this is a, a, a all right chart, but you can see Bristol Bay here, other Alaska, lower 48, Canada, Russia, and Japan. Okay, and those are your major North Pacific Ocean um, fisheries. There used to be an Atlantic salmon. Uh, it's it's what you see in the stores. Atlantic salmon now is usually a farm fish. There is a, a run of salmon that's uh, out of England and Scotland. It's called Atlantic salmon uh, in the rivers of Maine, New Hampshire, um, but. Uh, I don't, there's no commercial fishery of them anymore. Um, they might have some sport fishing. So anyway, see, most of your salmon runs are in these countries. Um, and you can see Bristol Bay is a significant portion of it every year. And this is just sockeye. 
Um, Do you we, see how much is Alaska though? Yeah. Bay yeah. Add Alaska. these two together. Yeah. yeah. You know, and and, and that's crazy. Well know, over half. Ten percent, maybe fifteen percent, is the rest of the world. So that's how important Alaska is to the world's sockeye um, fishery. And that I, don't, I should say all salmon. Uh, the pink salmon run is actually much bigger, and that's in southeast Alaska. It's a hundred million a run year sometimes, but value wise. Uh, sockeye salmon on the wholesale price is about a buck a pound. Uh, a pink salmon is about 15 to 30 cents a pound. Pink salmon are not a, a desirable, consumable fish. It is, but it's not. It, it's just different. Um, so here's another chart. You can see Bristol Bay's. This is just Bristol Bay's Quijack and Nushagak system, because of the two big rivers that feed Iliamna and the big Nushagak lakes. And then there's the other Bristol Bay. And that's the Igigit, Ugashic area. So, and then, you know, that's all. This is Alaska. This is Alaska. This is this is Russia. Straight across from Russia is the Kamchatka Peninsula, and they they have a pretty big chum run. They buy most of the chum salmon that comes out of Alaska because they like the eggs. Uh, Kenai River is Alaska. British Columbia, Copper River. You've all heard of Copper River because it's the first. It's it's popular only because it's the first one to come to fishery. It, 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 it spawns first because it's lower in, in elevate or altitude, not altitude, uh, uh, latitude. latitude. Latitude, okay, it's lower in latitude, so it spawns there first. Okay, so that comes to the market fresh first. That's the only re reason why Copper River is what it is. They marketed it like that, and it's the first one to hit the restaurants. Um, so anyway, you can see the size of the fishery. Yep, yep. So managing, how do we manage that run? And this is kind of what you guys have been talking about. In Alaska, since statehood, and statehood occurred just before 1960, about 1958, so it's one of our most recent states, the state took over management. ADFNG is the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. They have three goals that they have to do every year. The first one is to make sure that every river meets its spawning goal, okay? And they've done studies and studies over the years at the University of Washington called FRI, Fisheries Research Institute, and they have come up with an optimum number for every river that that river or lake system can, you know, sustain. And, and what's the best number that come out of every river? And we'll look at some specific numbers for that. The second goal is to conserve the profile of this game. And what does that mean? That means that they don't let us just fish everything right at the front end because we would then be shifting the spawners to a late spawning run. They want spawners from the first part of the run, they want spawners from the middle part of the run, they want spawners from the end of the run. So they, they give us little bites out of each part of the run as it comes in. And again, it's a three to four week period where all these fish come in. The bigger the run, the longer that period is. The shorter the run, the more compressed it is. It also has to do with weather. Um, if it's really, really cold, the fish hold off. They don't want to go up the rivers. But all of a sudden, if it warms up, they all just go like a banshee, just shoom. And then we call that a compressed run. And it makes it really hard on us as fishermen and on processors because all the fish come at once and we can't handle that. Okay? And then we don't get maximum quality or price and we and we lose and this is the third goal is to maximize the harvest and this is where the economic pressures come in for managing the run and that is for every fish that we don't catch beyond the sustainable escapement goal is tax revenue loss for the state of Alaska okay so the state legislatures the state government there they want us to catch every fish we can without hurting the run, okay? That's because they tax the raw fish value, okay? Every fish that caught is caught and we turn into the processor, the processor has to report that to ADF and G, and then they tax them, okay? And then we get taxed too, but not from the state. We get taxed from the local communities for a, a local tax. Um, so I just want to talk about <coughs> The management and what's happened with management again 1960 okay this is statehood right here you can look at this before statehood 1893 probably your biggest run was 25 million fish 
um, biggest run, your mean was probably down in this area, around eight to 10 million would be my guess, looking at that graph. This is the mean, but that includes this half of this chart, okay? And you can see after statehood, uh, right there, all of a sudden we had a 25 million dollar run, 25 million run, and then it went way down, and then all of a sudden it's jumped up, and we've been pretty steady in the 20 million range. And then we've even had some huge 45 million runs, you know, but we never had these size of runs when it wasn't managed. And it was managed before stated, I want to say, by the federal government, okay, before well, it was a territory. Um, uh, before Russia, when Russia owned it, they didn't really have a commercial fishery there. As soon as the state or the federal government started exercising its territorial rights, then some investment came. Um, and we started shipping supplies up there in canneries. But it was fished not on, a, on an hourly basis. We don't get fishing time, okay? We don't get an announcement from the Department of Fishing Game until they have a certain number up the river. And in, in the river I fish specifically, they want 100,000 fish up that river before we get any time at all. So we just sit there and wait, wait, and we watch every day. We, all the fishermen run up to the office and say, what were your numbers overnight? What were your numbers overnight? And we watch it, and all of a sudden, it, it starts trickling in, and all of a sudden, it jumps up. And then all of a sudden, it, it'll jump up from like 5,000, then all of a sudden, it jumps to 15, then all of a sudden, it jumps to 50. And we're like, oh, if it does another day like that, we're going to fish. So we got to go. So we watch very carefully as those days come in. And as soon as they have some escapement, we get to fish. Back in the federal days, they just said, okay, you're going to fish Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. If there's fish, there's fish. If there's not, they're not. And the two days off is that's what we'll get for escapement. It wasn't very scientific. It worked. <clears throat> uh, but look at what we've done with the knowledge we have now and how we maximized, I'd say. So do you think that you could hypothesize that the management and the only allowing the amount that the lake can sustain through has allowed the populations to increase in size for the fisheries as well as maintaining the stability of the run? Yes, I, I, I can think, I think you can see from this chart that the mid 70s on have been much more productive in the last 30 years than the 30 years prior to that. And they can, I think, attribute that to good management. I'll say this, that most of the world's biologists, fishery biologists, look to Alaska's biologists to see how to do it right. Okay, It's the one bright spot in terms of fisheries resources that the world has to look at that we've been able to sustain these kinds of numbers for a long period of time. We've been able to sustain um, fishing, whether it's halibut, crab, uh, or sockeye salmon, or pink salmon, to a large degree, for a number of years. And, and, and it should be perpetual and for time to come, as long as we preserve their spawning grounds and the ocean. There's there's a lot of threats to both, um, but now this is th these are the more recent runs. Okay, so this next year, 52 million. Okay, I got this. Um, it was issued 11:13 at 2 p.m. I probably looked at it at about 5 p.m. Okay, that was about what two and a half weeks ago. I, I look for this every November. This is the run forecast for this coming summer. This means, am I going to have a good year or a bad year? So you can see that they're predicting four, 52 million. The range is 44.8 to 63. Okay, it's a pretty big range. Um, but the middle of that is about 53, 54. They say 52 in this graph. But in terms of <coughs> where that's at historically, this, this is when I started fishing here, okay? Really bad. Okay. <laughs> but that's why I was able to get into it. It was really bad. Guess what the price of salmon was? Forty cents a pound. You know, you know. Uh, it went down here, and price was probably well. Last year, our price was about a buck 
15. Okay, so 40 cents to a buck 15, and we had some really good solid years. This is probably one of the most sustainable runs for a seven year period at a constant level that we've seen. If I jump back, you'll see it goes up and down a lot more. This, is, this was one of the biggest, long, solid, consistent runs we've seen. Then all of a sudden it dropped and dropped, and all of a sudden now we're at 52 million. Now if it comes in like that, and the price stays good. I can go to Florida again next year. <laughs> but um, tell you mentioned that that's how come you were able to get into fishing. Uh -huh. Can you explain that up and down bounce and what that does to the fishery and how you were so able to do that? The fishery is limited. Okay, it's a limited entry fishery. There are only a certain number of permits, and they are on the open market. If you wanted to start fishing. You go to the broker and you say, I need a permit to fish for the Soleil next year. And they say, okay, give me $175,000. Because that's what it is today. Um, so that's what it is when we have a 52 million run. And the price of a boat is about 200000 okay, for a medium middle of the road boat. <laughs> right here. Specifically in O2, you could get a permit for about twenty-two thousand dollars. Okay, and a boat you could get for forty to fifty thousand dollars. So you see, I could afford to get into it then. I couldn't afford to get into it now. <laughs> and what happens is, people who want to get into it now have to borrow money. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, the permit only if you're an Alaska resident can you borrow money from. The Alaska Bank or the Department of Economic, Social, whatever. Um, <laughs> they'll loan you money if you're Alaska resident for a permit. If you're not an Alaska resident, you can't borrow money to buy that because it's not a property that the bank can put a lien on, like your house, as hold for collateral because the permit's a special value. The only liens that can go on that are from the state of Alaska for back child support and um, state tax liens. Even the federal government has a hard time putting a tax lien on a Bristol Bay permit, okay, or any fishery permit, because it's we, we use it, it's a use permit, but we don't own it, okay? It's not a true ownership property. That's just the way they've set up their limited entry system. So economically, price goes up, value goes up. Okay, price, price of salmon goes up, it follows, and uh, the entry price to get into the fishery is really tough. So the crab fishing um, used to be wide open. Who's watched the deadliest catch? Yes. Okay, deadliest catch. Uh, back in the day, before they had crab rationalization and the buyback, um, you could own a boat and get a permit more easily than you could Bristol Bay, but the boat is the big hindrance because a boat costs about $2 million for a crab boat, okay? So this is, this is the forecast, okay? And this is where I want to talk about, um, these are the four river systems, okay? Or five river systems, Naknek, Kwejak, Yigik, Yigashik, Nushkak, and Togiak. We'll just exclude Togiak, because it's, it, it's a drop in the bucket, right? Um, I fished all of these, but you can see that the Naknek, Kwejak, has a total run of 28.8 million fish this year. That's bigger than some runs total. Wow. Okay, and you can see that the Quijack component of that is 15 million, and that 12 million. And these are separated in age classes, okay? 1.2s, 2.2s, 1.3s, and 3.6s. What this means is after they've um, hatched and everything, so they're actually, a 1.2 is actually add one, it's a four-year-old fish. It spends one year in the lake, two years in the ocean. Two years in the lake, two years in the ocean, one year in the lake, three years in the ocean, two in the lake, three in the ocean. So these are the bigger fish, these are the smaller fish. Okay? And that's they call them. I don't I don't know how they do it, but like I said, I don't know what tells them to stay in the lake two years, and I don't know what tells them to stay in the ocean three versus two. Yeah. It's just conditions, it's just something they know to do. And they've, they've talked about like, is it temperature of the water, is it? They've tried to the correlate it, yeah, with, with temperature of the water, um, conditions in the ocean. There's, you know, the El Nino, El Nino, they try to track that and correlate it. There's, there's all kinds, if you guys want to go onto this, go to the UW, go into fisheries research, and get your doctorate. 
<laughs> because that's what they do. And look at numbers all day. And every year they come up with all these algorithms and, and charts and tell us something new about when the fish are coming in. This is their preseason forecast, okay? Um, this is their escapement goal. Out of the 15 million that are going to go to the Quijack River, they want 7.69 of that in escapement. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Okay. So, so, so we're going to we're going to harvest another seven million of that. Yeah. Okay. So that's a they're going to spawn more than than we get to catch, and that's unique to the Quijack because that feeds Lake Iliamna. Okay, that huge lake. Yeah. That huge lake. A lot of fishermen believe that you can't over escape that lake. Okay. Versus Ugashic. Okay. 0.85 escapement, 850,000 to 2.7 harvest, okay, on a 3.7 run. That's a big Ugashic run. Last year's Ugashic run was, I think, about a million fish, okay? So that's almost three times as, well, it's over three times as big as last year's run. That's where I fished last year. Okay, I like Ugashic. So um, this looks pretty good, really good, but. So less than a million are going to be let through and they get a catch almost three million so they're letting a lot less through than they're going to actually catch because of the size of the lakes that they're going up to spawn into they're managing that how many are going to be able to be sustained up in that lake is that what they base your permits on on the Those statement numbers? um they base our per the permit prices on the market it's early and the it's it's on the market but like how many permits they release no, that, that it's, a, it's a limited guess. number. Of you can ask Ms. Sabo, you know, about the, look up some information, what's from um, smart capability, uh, right? <laughs> but I have to be within range. If I'm out more than three, four miles in the boat, I can't get that. Yeah. And, and, but they will email me, and, and that's a great resource. Other, if I can't do that, then I gotta get on my old bag phone, and I gotta try to call the fish and game guy if he's available, and then talk to him. And I, 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 I know him. I say, Tim, what's going on? And he'll tell me. Other than the radio, and we, on the local radio station up there, KDLG, there's only one. It's an AM station, right? <laughs> um, and it has NPR on it half the day, and then local news. The other, but on the hour at at 9 a.m., 12, 3, 6, and 8, they have fishery announcements. And I listen to those. <laughs> All of them, because they can change, like I said, hourly. So, but this is the preseason forecast during the season, okay? If we looked at the map of Alaska, the fish come in and they travel up the Aleutian chain. And about a week before they get to Bristol Bay, they hit Port Moeller, okay? And we have an in-season forecasts, adjustments being made based on a Port Moeller fishery. That Port Moeller fishery is supported now by our tax dollars that they tax us and then we give it to a, a entity called the BBEDC, Bristol Bay Economic Development Corporation, and then they give it to the Port Moeller fishing. And they go out and they test for about 10 days, they go out and fish, and those results are reported. And do, not only are the numbers reported from different stations, every time they fish and come back, they send a genetic sample to Anchorage. And about three days later, we get a genetic analysis of where that fish is heading to specifically. Now, sometimes that's too late, okay? Because like I said, we're fishing. We can't fish numbers. And a lot of times the genetic stuff comes back, and if we haven't already chosen the right place to be, if the genetics come back and say, all these fish are going to the Nushagak River, and I'm down in Ugashik, if I transfer to the Nush, they make me wait out 48 hours before I can fish again. That's the cost to transfer. Wow. Okay? So it's like college football. <laughs> it is. It is it, 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 it's a huge gamble. And if I don't make the right choice, it can cost me thousands, if not the season. Okay, so that 48 hours, I, so just to give you an idea, if we get, if I moved in the wrong time for 48,000, I'll miss 20 to 30,000 pounds. My run goal is usually around 100,000 pounds. That's a third of my income on the bad decision. So I get pretty nervous about that. So anyway. Um, 
so we talked about management. Not only do they have to manage for uh, us as fishermen and for their spawning holes, but in Alaska, they have to consider subsistence rights. And it's a huge issue. It's, an, it's a very important issue because particularly in the Bristol Bay region, we have uh, watershed residents or native Alaskans that rely about, uh, I think the last statistic was over 30%, whether you're native or not, rely on subsistence living styles. And what does that mean? They do their own fishing? They do their own fishing, yes. They have to, and, and, they, and they used to historically use uh, <coughs> fish wheels and fish traps. They can use gill nets now. Uh, they call them subsistence nets. They're shorter nets and they're shorebound. Um, and they have to put up all their fish for the winter in the same period. And this is, this is a typical fish camp. Um, I've visited several fish camps. Uh, but like I said, 30%, whether you're native or not, if you live up in the Bristol Bay area, you live a somewhat of a subsistence lifestyle. And when I say that, you say, oh, well, those are Eskimos and, and Aleuts, and that was back in the day. Well, like I said, this is a picture probably taken last year, year before. Um, it's not a native Alaskan, but I think it's a resident. And this is up in um, Bear. No, this is no. I think this is Nome. Uh, it's a chum salmon they're putting up. But I don't know. Most of the people I know who live up there, and there's only 1,800 residents in the Dillingham area, they all hunt and fish. They all gather berries. Um, and they take pride in living a subsistence lifestyle. Um, it's, it's a huge not economic being, but it's, it's vastly important. Right now there's a, a big depletion of king salmon, or Shugnook salmon, on the Yukon. And that's uh, up towards Nome. And their king salmon, they get a lot of chum salmon, but the king salmon is their traditional fish. It's the best eating fish. And all, for whatever reason, they're not getting the returns. And they think it's because of trawlers out in the uh, bay that are catching uh, the king salmon because they're a deeper fish and they're catching them when they're catching pollock. Um, or they're doing a lot of studies right now. A lot of money is being fed from the political um, house to, to study and see why we're losing these, these king salmon. Um, and it's mostly to protect the subsistence rights. Um, I can't. And they're, they're very important, the subsistence uh, leaders and the Alaska leaders in fighting. Uh, to keep the area of Bristol Bay uh, alive and well. Because if it wasn't up for, to them, as a non-resident, I don't have any voting power. Okay, So if I see something I don't like happening up in Bristol Bay, whether it's offshore drilling or a mine proposal, I don't have a vote. I can't call up uh, my legislator in Alaska. i got to call up a legislator here in Arizona and say, hey, can you do something about Alaska mining? It's ruining my livelihood. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't carry as much weight as the subsistence leader saying, hey, you're ruining hundreds of my family's, hundreds of years of my family's traditions and, and my grandkids too. So that has a lot more impact. And right now, there's a huge uh, proposal for a pebble mine. Um, what does pebble mine spell? Perpetually endangered Bristol Bay's livelihood and economy. Okay? Pebble mine is a mine, uh, proposed mine site up here. It's, it's right above Lake Iliamna. And it feeds, it'll affect these creeks that go into the Nushagak River and obviously the Quijack River. Um, and that big lake. And that big lake. Um, just to give you a, a sense of scale, you know, there's a lot of copper mines here in Arizona as well. Um, there's one in Utah. Uh, this is a copper and gold mine. It's, it's said to be one of the most valuable mine proposals or mine finds ever. Uh, there's, there's one in South America that they found recently. But what we like to say, it's, it's a great mine, but it's in the wrong place. You know, uh, and to give you a sense of scale, this is 5,000 feet right there. Okay, this is the proposed mine for the Tailings Pond. 5,000 feet is a little bit less than a mile, right? So that's that. So we're looking one, two, 
three, four, five miles. It's supposed to be one of the biggest open pit mines ever. You'll see it from space if it's built. This is this is the Utah mine or something, but this is to give you some scale. You know, that's one of those huge trucks. Um, yeah. Pebble mine will be bigger than this. Um, you know, so what are the what are the arguments for the mine? Well, if this mine was built, um, it would provide a lot of jobs for a lot of people up there. They would have to they'd have to build a power plant that's bigger than Anchorage, right? What? No, no, it's bigger than bigger than the power plant that's feeding Anchorage. Oh. Okay. Oh. So oh my gosh. the power yeah, like, the yeah. power demands of this mine are greater than the power demands of all of Anchorage. Okay. So. If they build this mine, they're going to have to build a dam for cheap electricity because they can't do coal. They don't have any roads up there. This is all tundra and marshland, and uh, it's all—it's a big aquifer, and uh, it's so they—they they have to build this huge road, at another port on the other side of the peninsula, and. It, huge dam to feed it power. So we're talking a huge infrastructure, an infrastructure that would that would bring in a lot of development. And they say that that, that mine will produce 20 to 30 years. Billions Just dollars. Just real quick, so who owns the land that it's on? Is it owned by the state of Alaska? Is it it's owned land? by the state. And, so the state and, does the state and, ultimately then make the decision? Yes. Yeah. Northern Dynasty is the, the proposed uh, company, that company to... to uh, exploit the mine, but they own the lease. They bought the lease in an auction from uh, Governor Murkowski. Um, Governor, so they own the lease on the land. Yeah, from the state. They they lease the gold and mineral rights from from Governor Murkowski about 15 years ago before he left office. So, um, and and in doing so, there was a lot of backdoor deals, but this land was originally not reserved as a mine proposal, and then at the last minute it got turned over to the land and mine um, development. Anyway, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of arguments for the mine. Uh, if, from the state's perspective, that this mine, and you got to think, oil, oil, oil is a huge revenue for Alaska. If you're a resident of Alaska, you don't pay state income taxes, you get paid. Okay? How sweet so, is that? Who's moving to Alaska? Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, and, and this last year's uh, check was about $1,200 for every resident. Okay? You just got your $1,200 check. It's usually around $800, $600, $800. This last year was $1,200 because the price of oil went way up. Now the price of oil is going down, their royalty check is going to go down. They call it their dividend check, right? So, but if, if this was built, they argue that the state's revenues would triple oh. because of the value and the tax value from the gold and copper that would be extracted from the mine. That's how, it's, it's a huge economic um, powerhouse. Now obviously the people that are against the mine are balanced and saying, yeah, 20 to 30 years of good revenue, but you're going to have another 100 years of Bristol Bay revenue. Yeah. You know, what, which would you rather have? And that's the choice that they have to make. Um, oops, went wrong. Okay, food chains, not gold chains. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. So I'm gonna look over my notes, make sure I haven't missed anything that I want to talk about. Yeah, that covers it. All right. Do you have any questions? I know you have questions because you were supposed to write questions. So there are two, there are two engaged. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry if we already covered this and I missed it, but did you mention what your stance on Pebble, the Pebble mine was? But mine. I try. I try not to put my what, my bias. What could I ask? What do you think it would be? Are you looking at the screen? Um, <laughs> well, I, ob obviously you don't. Want it because then your or your industry will I, go down. I, but if you're looking I, at it from like a non-biased point of view, yeah. and you're seeing okay, so I listened today. If you, I was in the car today and I listened to NPR, and um, they, today's topic was all about um, the Dan Hill 
uh, disaster that just happened, I think just yesterday or the day before, and it was the coal ash. It was a coal ash dump into the river in North Carolina. And coal ash is the leftovers of a coal power plant, and, and it has cadmium, lead, and arsenic in it, and it went into the rivers there. And I, I truly believe that, especially in Arizona, I think we're a little more attuned to it than those in Seattle, because Seattle has a lot of it. Um, water. Water is a huge issue. It's, it's our most valuable resource we have. I think that as you guys get older and as your kids get older, uh, water is going to be even more important. Um, you know, you can just look at our Hoover Dam and Lake Roosevelt. Um, we're Lake Mead. Lake Mead. Look at look what happened at California last year. So my stance on it is, yeah, leave, leave our waters alone. And, and we really need to start taking our fresh water seriously because it not only supports human life, it supports all natural life. And, and without the clean <coughs> water in Alaska, we wouldn't have the sockeye fishery, the salmon fisheries that we have. The reason why we have such an abundant resource up there is because we don't have people up there polluting it. Is that the concern is the mine is the runoff? Yeah. It's, Talk it's, about Washington's fishery and how... Yeah, so we're from Washington and um, I grew up... Most, most of the fishermen in Alaska have come from the Seattle area. Um, one, Alaska's you know, pretty remote. Two, all the fish comes through Seattle, but um, for shipment and, and sales and whatnot. So it's kind of a Seattle controlled fishery. And Alaska people hate it, but that's just the way it is. And it's gradually changing. But in Washington, everybody used to fish there. Um, we ended up with the Bolt decision in the mid 70s. And the Bolt decision was all about Native American rights to fish in Washington and it divided the fishery, the commercial fishery between the Native Americans and the commercial fishermen 50-50 and, th and that drove a lot of people out of business so we all went to Alaska and started fishing more heavily up there but at the same time that fishery was dying in Washington to the point that there is no fishery anymore. In the Puget Sound we used to have right three four miles from where we used to live it was a big park and they used to have in the 30s and 40s a, a huge sane fishery right there in Puget Sound and there's a lot of sport fishing there now but there's there is not the resource for any type of commercial fishery I mean you would catch maybe 10 20 fish and it's you know. because of and it's because of people uh, it's people that's the main you know polluting source uh, we have a lot more population that sewer water runs off into the Puget Sound. You, you can be in the plane or you can look in Google Google Earth and you can see the blue water and the brown yuck. You know, the fluent that comes out. You can, you can look at the coast of California. Every city has a fluent going out the coastline. You can see it for miles. It's just a big affluent. And you, you can see the fish coming from the ocean and hitting that. And, and they're just going, Ugh, I can't, how, how long do I have to live in that? How, how can I get through that? And truth be known, they can't. But in Washington, it was primarily the, the logging industry, the roads, road, poor road construction, runoff, anything runoff, and then poor sewer treatment. Sorry. Yeah, no. So for what reason would the, the, um, the mine even need to be built then? I mean, you said to create jobs and stuff, but I guess I'm not really sure why, why even it would have to exist. Copper. Okay, it's, it's the huge thing is copper and the price of gold. You know, the price of gold went over a thousand dollars an ounce, and every every mining company uh, went searching for any deposit it could find because there's a lot of money to be made, and it's it, it is it's just about money uh, with the gold issue. The copper is a <coughs> we're using less and less copper, obviously, but mm -hmm. copper is a, a just like water. It's a limited resource, and and we gotta treat it wisely. And the other thing that's in that mine is molybdenum, molybdenum. Okay. And unfortunately, gov uh, her father was Governor Murkowski, but now Lisa Murkowski, the senator from Alaska, she's on the uh, minerals and something committee back in Washington, D.C. And she's declared part of the, we need to be more dependent on ourselves or independent, not dependent on other people other countries for our minerals and part of that is developing more mining in the US so we're not relying on Russia or Japan or right. 
or South America for our, for our molybdenum. Yeah. <laughs> Which is what? Used for like electronics or something? Yeah, and yeah. Do you guys know why the price of gas has gone down? Because we started drilling here. Yeah. yeah. We've started mm -hmm. drilling like crazy. Yeah, yeah. We're, you know, it, and it is. It's uh, and it. I think I think that the price of gas is going down because the world's mad at Russia, and and Russia is is an oil producer, and and nothing hurts Russia more. You can look back at when they were in Afghanistan and they went bankrupt. What hurt them was the price of oil was down, and they weren't making any revenues. If we want to put a hurt on Russia or the oil OPEC countries we produce oil or we don't use as much oil and we make the world price go down. When that goes down, our relative stance becomes more powerful. And we need that in terms of Russia because of what they're doing in Crimea and whatever. <laughs> and it's all full circle, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Um, is there a difference between fishing cold water and warm water other than just like the climate? Because my dad was a warm water fisherman. Uh, like down in uh, saltwater warm water? Like, yeah. Uh, Florida. So I have some uh, friends that fish mullet in uh, Florida. To, no, you know, there's, it's just a different fish. You know, they're like tuna. Yeah. Tuna is a big high ocean fishery, and uh, you have dolphin bycatch. A lot of times um, when I talk about gill netting, people think, oh, you get all that bycatch, right? Because it's not drift, high sea drift fishing, where they just throw it out in the middle of the ocean and catch whatever. We're right in the mouths of specific rivers, so our bycatch is virtually nil. Yeah. But if you go out into the warmer waters and the high seas fisheries, you're going to catch all kinds of pelagic species, and that's pelagic fish are highly migratory species. Okay, like tuna, yeah. um, cod are actually a highly migratory species. When you talk about pelagic fish, you talk about cod <coughs> on the Atlantic coast. But those are cold water fish. I don't know a lot of uh, warm water fisheries other than like grouper and the Hawaiian fisheries. Very valuable. You, and who's the big buyer? Who's the big buyer of fish in the world? Japan. Japan, China more so now. Okay, China and Japan. Japan, they, they fish like no other country. And they have a big population. We need to eat more fish. It's better for you. My dad goes to Las Vegas. <coughs> Where? My dad is a pilot, mm -hmm. so when he has layovers in Alaska, he'll pick up some salmon and stuff and bring it back. Yeah, no, it, <laughs> a lot of people ask me just to talk about fish. And uh, there's a difference between farm, farm fish, okay? Mm -hmm. um, the World Health, uh, Food Organization think, oh, farm fish is the answer to the world's hunger problems, right? Mm -hmm. If we can farm fish, it's a good protein, right? But there's a lot of difference between, is, what you feed, whether it's your fish, chicken, cow, is what you eat, right? Right. So if you feed a cow instead of grass, you're going to get a corn-fed fat cow, right? If you feed a fish corn or, or a vegetable fat, which is primarily what they feed farm fish, you're going to get the fat from the corn in the fish, and you're not going to have a red meat you're going to have a gray meat. Yeah. And, and that's why and so I, I take pride in this. Because right? <laughs> like, I was involved with um, this organization and they, they sued uh, Fred Meyer and Kroger's and everything because they weren't properly labeling their farm fish. And I wrote them a letter and I said, you need to be labeling this, right? And they wrote, I said, no, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, then about six months later, they had to change their ways because they got sued. Not by me, but, <laughs> but so you go into the stores yeah, and you see the foreign fish, and the little tiny print says color added. Oh, the oh last few, God. the last few weeks before they harvest a farm fish, they feed it dyed pellets. Oh, oh. it's it's the same thing they put in uh, eggs in the chicken feed to make the yolks yellow. Yeah. Think about it that way. So I'm not just I'm not talking just farm fish, but it's the same it's the same kind of diet that they put in eggs. What color is the yolk from those chickens if they don't feed them that? It's not it's not a bright yellow. It's a brownish yellow. Yeah. 
so so they so it, it, it's a it's a I told you it was a carotid, right? It was a carotid. And carrots have a natural carotid in it. Shrimp have a natural carotid in it. Algae have a natural carotid in it that make fish that color natural pink. Okay, if, if it's, it's like keratin, you know, yeah, keratin, carotid, keratin, and carotids are very good for you, for your eyesight, and it's a, one of those mega things. But the dyes that they feed the farm, but the dyes are, don't help your eyesight. No. In fact, in fact, that they they found that that the dyes, the artificial dyes that they use in high dosage, will actually do damage to your eyes. So you are what you eat. You are what you are what you eat. But in terms of whether you eat fish beef or chicken, there's no doubt that the omega-3s from a fish are very, very valuable. They're, they're, they're now injecting coma patients with omega-3s while they're in comas because they know that their memories when they come out are around 10 times, I, I'm just excited, I don't know what specific, but 10 times better than if they don't get the omega-3s while they're in the coma because it's a good brain food. So on Monday, we'll bring in some... Good salmon. Yay! Wild Yay. salmon. Do you want some? Thank you for listening. Yeah. Nice. Thank you, Eric. Paleo. Any other questions? If I can go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> On your bike. Thank Abby. you. <laughs> what? Thank you for coming in. Thank you. Three minutes, guys. Nice. I can't get it.